Regenerative agriculture is just booming. I think this is a train that you're not going to stop. I think the interest in regenerative agriculture from, you know, right up to political levels to even scientists getting engaged to on farm, it, it's just massive. And what's interesting is often you find people are doing things in their local areas and not talking about it. And so I think the uptake is actually much, much higher than what we, what we think. When Europeans came in, the changes in these environments were catastrophic. These environments changed within two or three years, they say, with grazing pressures, and then in came the rabbits, everything else, took that soil right down. We have no idea in this country what healthy soils look like. We're just barely scratching on the surface of what did it look like pre-Europeans. And we can only guess, and we start training our eye, thinking that some of these conditions are normal. They're not. These are not normal events. And what we're seeing around the world, and it's the interesting thing with travel, is we've gone from drought to flash flood. Drought, flash flood. Even in New Zealand, I know I'm not allowed to say drought in New Zealand in the same sentence, but we do have droughts, right? What is happening in these environments? What's causing this? I really believe that Australia holds the key to regenerative agriculture because you guys are the front. So when we're looking at regenerative, we look at how do we repair a disturbance event. So that disturbance event might be what? What do we do to disturb soils? Overgraze. Overgraze, fertilizers, the fungicides, the seed treatments, are all disturbance events. So it's interesting to see these two different properties. So we're seeing a property that's right at the beginning of what's possible for these landscapes. So just beginning on that regenerative journey from really looking at what's happening with pasture and how can we manage land a little differently to a property here with Charlie that he's been working in this system since the 90s and you know really looking at okay what's working well for him is that you know he's got a, a low input system that you know really is functioning pretty pretty well. I don't think most farmers know their soils in, ter in terms of digging a hole. They know what soils do in different um, seasonal conditions and how they might operate say when it's wet or dry but they don't really understand the full potential of their soils. I have no qualms generally on dropping someone's fertiliser bill by 50 to 70 percent when we start. I have no issues with that at all because we address the inefficiency, right? It's all about biology. What's the most interesting bit of this graph? More the net, profit. net profit, right? So they're 78% 70, more profitable. When we go down to the pub and you talk with your mates, what do you talk about? The weather probably, right? But no. <laughs> How much you sold your stock for? How much you sold your stock for? What you weaned at? What you fattened? What your yield was? None of that matters. None of it counts. What you sold your stock for, awesome, but was it actually profit if you were putting out a bale of hay every day or whatever you're doing to feed that animal. We don't talk about what's important and it's actually profitability. This isn't new information, it's just been presented maybe newly to them and it's things that actually people know, they know what's, that something hasn't been working as well as it could do and that might be around water cycles or carbon cycles or they're seeing encroaching weeds and insects and situations that seem to be getting more droughty but actually it's around soil management so you get people having these aha moments because they can relate it to a lifetime of working on the land and not having that piece of information that kind of pulls it all together but what they're doing while they're moving through the soil is they're gobbling up nitrogen nitrogen and phosphorus I want you to think of these two as they're, they're like the fertilizer bags, okay? So all the nutrients held in their bodies, they're not going to give it up. They're not going to give it up until what? They die. They die. <laughs> the clues really under, are underneath the ground. So if we're looking even at our weeds, what kind of root structures do they have? Are they lovely, strong, healthy root systems? Are they quite shallow? If these species have quite shallow roots, they're telling you something probably about your grazing in part it's the soil type so these are the self mulching clays that we see that people love to have they're, they're big soils they hold a lot of nutrients but when you work with them biologically it's it's how to get them so they stop this big the big cracking process that actually they hold together so we're seeing really beautiful aggregation in this soil and a lot of fungi which is brilliant to see you guys have to watch me uncomfortably dig a hole actually Gwen I should get you to do this <laughs> Right, we want to have a look. So what colour sh should these nodules be? Red. Red. 
oh, there's a lot of fungus in here. And whenever you're going onto a property, I never know, like, is this degraded from what it used to be or is this hugely improved? And so that's why you've got to dig holes and start benchmarking that for yourself, all right? 